evil lurks in the hearts of men. The shadow knows. <laughs> Shadow, mysterious character who furthers the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. The Shadow uses his hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice of the Shadow belongs. Today's story, Mansion of Madness. <laughs> Anybody home? Well, you didn't expect there would be, did you, Lamont? Well, we didn't think we saw a light as we came up the road, Margot. Well, then try again. What in the world is a medieval castle doing in this country, Lamont? Oh, you know how castles get around. Well, I guess it's useless, Margot. No one seems to... Well, at last. Come on, Margot. Ooh. Well, how do you do? We, uh... uh you will please come this way. <clears throat> Thank you. Come on, Margot. Lamont, do you see what I hope I don't see? Quiet, Margot. I, uh, I hope you'll pardon our intruding on you here. We, uh, we stall down the road. You will please be seated. Yes. Yes, thank you. As, uh, I started to say, we will stall down the road. I will strike a light. Thank you. Our car was so... Now I will call the master. Thank you. Uh, Margot, would you be interested in hearing how we were stalled you down You will the... please be seated. <laughs> nice, pleasant little man, wasn't he? Did you see his face? I saw half of it. It's all he has. One side is as flat as a coin. No eye, no ear. Yes, I saw it plainly enough, Lamont. Look at this room. Those old tallow flambeau on the wall. Everything seems so musty and old. Oh, Lamont, let's get out of here, can we? I don't like this. Be careful, Margot. Someone's coming. Look, Margot. Good evening. My man tells me you've had trouble with your car. Well, yes, we, uh, we're stuck in the mud up the road a bit. I know this is an awfully late hour. Oh, to... no apologies, please. It isn't often that visitors come to Belhaden, even by accident. Permit me to introduce myself. I am Caldus Madisal, uncle of Millicent Chantelford. Present mistress of Balhouten Castle. On her behalf and on my own, I welcome you. Thank you. Mr. Montessor, Miss Margot Lane. Charmed, Miss Lane. How do you do? Mr. Cranston, Mr. Montessor. How do you do, sir? Delighted, Mr. Cranston. May I ask him what way I can serve you? Well, I'd like very much to use your telephone. I want to call a garage. Telephone? And... We have no such thing here. No telephone? Nothing new has been put into this castle since it was built in 1640. Nearly 300 years ago. 300 years ago? That's correct. Valhaven was built by Sir Austin Chancellor in the early 16th century. Would you uh, step over here a moment, please? Oh, yes. Yes. Come on. Yes, come on. This is a portrait of Sir Austin. Hmm. Interesting looking character. He was forced to flee his native land because of political differences. He built this castle in the hope that he could create in this new land a replica of his ancestral estates. And uh, did he find happiness? Come here to this window. Do you see that tower? It's a bit difficult, surrounded by mist as it is. Right. I don't quite... Oh, yes, 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 I see it. Sir Austin was found hanging by a rope from its rafters. Suicide. Oh, horrible. There's a superstition that has clung to Balhattan ever since. A superstition? About Sir Austin's death? There are those who claim that the tragedies of Balhattan recur just as they happened originally. Right down to the present day. <laughs> what was that? Well, now pay no attention, Mr. Cranston. Don't be frightened, Miss Lane. It's a girl. What's wrong with her? <laughs> Millicent, go back to your apartment, child. Millicent. The mistress of Balhouten. Uncle. It's here, Uncle. It's not in my imagination this time. It started in her dressing room. It moved across the east balcony and down the service stairs. You know there's not been a cat in Balhouten since your mother passed on. Only that one, Uncle. That one. Now, Millicent, have you ever seen a cat here? No, but I hear it, Uncle, wailing just as it did when I found poor Mother. Oh, oh, oh. come, my dear, you're frightening our guests. 
Miss Lane, Mr. Cranston, permit me to present Miss Millicent Chancellor. Miss Chancellor. My dear, we're intruding horribly. Welcome to you both. I hope you won't think me ill bred. Oh, not at all, Miss Millicent. Miss Lane and Mr. Cranston have had a bit of an accident. They came here for help. An accident? Oh, my dear, you're not hurt? There's nothing serious, Miss Millicent. Our car is stuck in the mud. We were unable to go any further. Then by all means, you must stay here tonight. Well, that, that's very kind of you, Miss Millicent, but I... I think we'll push on to the nearest village. I'm afraid that's not feasible. The nearest house is ten miles away. Well beyond the moor. Ten miles? You couldn't attempt it in this storm. I see only one way out. You must permit us to offer the hospitality of Bellhouse. Why, that's very kind of you, but I think... You're most welcome. I'll have my man prepare rooms for you. And it's very late, Millicent. You must be off to bed. Yes, Uncle Caldus. I'm not afraid now that I know there are others in the castle. Good night, Miss Lane. Good night, Mr. Cranston. Good night, Miss Nelson. Good night. I believe I owe you both an explanation. You see, the child had a frightful shock several years ago. A shock? Yes. Her mother was paralyzed during the latter years of her life. And being quite eccentric, she lived here alone, unattended. Millicent was at school in Europe. For many months, Millicent received no answer to her letters. So she came back to Valhauden and found her mother's skeleton oh. in this room. Oh, oh, oh. Seated in a wheelchair, her only companion beside her. A cat. Well, that... Uh... That explains this, uh, the, the cat thing. Oh, it explains many things, Mr. Cranston. The voices she hears. The departed chancellor for two, in her distorted imagination, return to Bellhouden. Oh, the poor girl. Oh, I'm sure this all must be very trying to you both. I'll hurry uh, Cebu along with your room. Make yourselves comfortable. I'll be back directly. Yes, uh, thank you. Well, Margot, not a pretty situation, is it? Definitely not. What can we do, Lamar? I'm not sure, Margot, but I'd like to stay. In fact, I must stay. Why? Well, Margot, it seems that many invisibles walk the halls of Belhaden. Tonight, there will be one other. The Shadow. you want? To help you. If help is possible, I'm a friend. I don't recognize your voice. You say you're a friend. What's your name? I have no name, really. I'm called the Shadow. Shadow? I don't understand. Are you one of the visions? No, not one of the visions. Please let me explain. I'm a living, breathing mortal just like you, but I possess a hypnotic power through which I can create a mental mist that makes me invisible. Then you're not... You're not one of them. Them? The Chancellorfords. You're not Sir Austin or old Barton. There's nothing supernatural about me, Miss Millicent. These, these Chancellorfords you speak of, they're dead? Oh, yes, but they come back. They come back to Belhauden with every change of the moon. With every change of the moon? Have you seen them? I've seen old Barton. Just as he was the night his Hindu servant threw the knife at his throat and killed him. A Hindu servant, sir, did yes. you say? Why? Oh, nothing. Uh, tell me about old Barton. Who was he? He was my grandfather. The last male in the Chancellorford line. You say he was killed? Yes. It happened on the main staircase. Old Barton had just come from a hunt on the moors with his mahounds. Now, tell me exactly what it is you've seen. His murder. Just as it happened 18 years ago. First, I hear his hounds howling out there on the moor. Then I hear his footsteps on the stairs. Climbs slowly to the first landing. Then he stops short. His hand goes to his throat. He makes a gurgling sound and turns and topples down the stairs. Has anyone else seen this? Anybody but yourself? No. And nobody believes me either. <laughs> I don't suppose you do. I believe you're sincere, Miss Millicent. Everybody humors me like I was mad. Sebo was rude enough to smile when I told him about the vulture. Vulture? Oh, of course. You don't know about that. It perches in the tree just outside that window. It comes when old Barton does. Nothing I do will drive him away. It just sits there. It's hollow eyes staring at me, emitting horrible sounds. You're positive you see all this, Miss Millicent. I mean, there could be no mistake. Oh. 
spare you. You see, you doubt me also. You said you wanted to help me. How do you think you can? I don't know. I'd hoped there might be a way, but frankly, I'm bewildered. I just don't know. why we've been called to court? I've told you, Margot. Mr. Montesol has asked us to testify to what we saw and heard that night at Belhowden Castle. But why? We've been waiting here all this time. Why can't we just go in and tell what we saw and get out of here? Because the court isn't in session. They've declared a recess. A recess? Oh, ridiculous. Schoolboy stuff. <laughs> I'll bet you that if women were running these places, things would happen a lot faster than they do now. Now, now wait a minute. I seem to recall a few shopping trips with you, my dear. Oh, well, that's different. And the people that hang around here. Look at them. Pure criminal types, every one of them. Well, who, for instance? Well, that man who just came out of that room, for instance. That man there? Yes. Darling, that's the judge. Oh. The court is reconvening. Let's go inside. You have heard the testimony of Margot Lane and Lamont Cranston. Two unimpeachable oh, witnesses. Oh, Lamont, this is horrible. We've been summoned to this courtroom to help send that poor girl to an institution. We couldn't help ourselves, Margo. We had to tell what we saw and heard at Belhouden that night. Oh, poor Millicent. She uh, looks so alone Honor, and deserted. It is quite obvious that the defendant, Millicent Chandleford, is of unsound mind. The evidence proves that beyond a question of doubt. My client, called us Montesol, has exercised extreme patience in caring for this unfortunate girl. But now he feels that for her own good, she should be placed in an institution where she can receive proper professional attention. That's not so. That's an infernal lie. Millicent's as sensible as anyone in this quiet, courtroom. Quiet in the car. Oh, Robert, my darling. Silence. Young man, what is the meaning of this outburst? I'm, I'm sorry, Your Honor, but I just couldn't sit here and listen to all these lies any longer. If the court please. Uh, uh, just a moment, Counselor. Young man, come up here. Yes, sir. Now, what is your connection with the defendant, Millicent Chancelford? Well, she's the girl I love. The girl I hope to marry. Until her uncle, Mr. Montesol, shut her away from me. Your Honor, this boy is simply a disgruntled, rejected suitor. I demand Rejected that... by whom? By Millicent? All right, I'll show you how much of a rejected suitor I am. Millicent, Millicent, tell him you love me. I do, Robert. I love you with all my heart. There. There, you see, Judge? Your Honor, I object to this display. Judge, let me take Millicent away. Let me marry her and give her the protection and affection she deserves. Young man, I wish the problem before the court could be settled that easily. <laughs> if it pleases the court, I would like to proceed with argument on the motion to put this girl in an institution. It pleases the court to recess for ten minutes. Perhaps we can resume in a more sedate atmosphere. Everyone will stand up as the judge leaves the courtroom. Margot, I have an idea. And I think it can be executed yeah. by the shadow. Whoever you are, this is an impossible thing you ask. I'd like to do it for you. Lord knows you've done enough for law and order. But I've got to hand down a decision. Sign the girl's commitment papers today. Give me two days' time, Your Honor. Just two days' postponement. But I just can't grant a postponement on nothing. Your Honor, you've got to give me some time to accomplish my job. Uh, well... Please, Your Honor. I'll tell you what I'll do. Yes, I'm probably a sentimental old fool, but I'll give you 24 hours. If you're not back with something definite in that time, I'll have to commit the girl. 24 hours? That's all. Perhaps it'll be sufficient. There's a change in the moon tonight. Change in the moon? What in blazes has that to do with the case? Maybe nothing, Your Honor. Maybe everything. <laughs> funny, Miss Lane, the way things change in just a few hours. Today, when you and Mr. Cranston were testifying, I was sure I could go on hating you both for the rest of my life. We were in a bad spot, Robert. Oh, I'll say. But I can see now just how Montesol made use of your visit to Belhouden. Why, it was the sort of a break he was looking for. 
two prominent people like you to bear out his contention that Millicent was mad. Nice fellow, that Montessor. He'd make a nice trophy for a hunting room. Not <laughs> <laughs> you're incorrigible. Say, we're getting here, Bell Howden. Uh, don't you think we'd better go over what we're expected to do, Mr. Cranston? There's not much to it, Robert. You and Miss Lane will wait in the car. I'll get into the castle somehow. Then I'll open the side door under Millicent's apartment for you and Miss Lane. But we must move quickly before Montessor notices us. It sounds simple the way you tell it, but how are you ever going to do it? I'll let you in on a little secret, Robert. I do it all with mirrors. did you manage to get in here without without Uncle Caldas catching you? Now don't give me the credit, Millicent. Mr. Cranston did it. I don't know how, but he turned the trick. <laughs> well, Mr. Cranston, the important thing is you and Miss Lane are here. And you brought my darling. That's all that comes. Oh, Robert. Darling, I, I don't know what we're going to do, but... Oh, but oh, that... Listen. Cat, it's here. It's starting again. Oh, don't be frightened, darling. You won't face it alone tonight. There's a change in the moon. They'll all be here soon. Old Bart will be coming across the moors with his hounds. The cat is right here in the castle. Oh, yes. It's in Mother's apartment off the east balcony. Mr. Cranston, look. Look. What is it, Robert? It's there in the tree outside the window. It's the vulture. Vulture? Yes, he's right close to the window. He's almost within reach. Yes, Robert, let me have that letter opener there on the desk. All right, I'll get it for you. What are you going to do, Lamont? I'm going to try my hand at the gentle art of knife throwing. Here you are, Mr. Cranston. That's all to do with it. Sharp and heavy. Yes, fine, Robert. All right. There. Step back, Margot. Come over here, Millicent. All right, Mr. Creston, let her go. <clears throat> oh, a bullseye. You stuck it right in his breast. Yes. But still he sits and squawks. Interesting. Very interesting. I could have told you. You can't get rid of him. There's nothing you can do. He always waits for old Barton's death. Close the window, Robert. Shut him out. No, wait. I hear something out on the moor. Now, you hear that? They're moving across the moor. Old Barton's with them. He'll be here in a minute. They're coming this way. Oh, Robert. Robert. It's all right, darling. It's, it's all right. I don't see how anyone could live in a place like this and still hold on to their sanity. Others have reasoned that way, Margot. You mean Montessor, I suppose. I don't exclude him. Mr. Cranston. Yes? I think I hear somebody moving about downstairs. Yes? Margot, put out that limbo. I'm going out in the hall. I don't want the light to stream through. All right. There you are. Now, quiet while I open the door. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Cranston. I'm going with you. All right, Robert. Open up. Be careful, Robert. Easy, boy. Step through, Robert. Right. Now, close it. Follow me. Robert. Yes? Drop down behind this balustrade. We can see the stairs from here. Mr. Crest. Yes? Look. We're coming around that car. Ah, that's our man. Now watch it. Old Barton? Maybe. Can, can, can you see his face? No. Cape hides it. He's near the landing. Be ready to run, Robert. But what are we going to do? Head him off before he can get to that big black stone at the bottom of the stairs. Look. Look, he stopped on the landing. Ready now? <laughs> that's exactly as Millicent described it. Old Barton chokes and then he falls down the stairs. Come on, Robert. Stop. Stay where you are. Sir. Show me, say. Look out, Mr. Cranston. Grab it. I got him. No use, mister. We're on to your hoax. Out of the way, Robert. No, you don't. There. You've got enough, Mr. Kosher. Oh, no, eh? You got him, Mr. Cranston. You nailed him right in the butt. Robert. Robert. Millicent, it's all right. Now, don't worry. That was quick work. Who is he, Lamont? I don't know, Margo. We'll see. Strike a match, Robert. I'll turn him over. Sure. Boy, you should have seen that sock Mr. Cranston gave me. All right. Now, we'll see who the... The half-faced man. See, Boo. Robert. Yes, Mr. Creston? Take Millicent to her apartment. Margot, you come with me. All right, Millicent. Let's go. Come on, Margot. All right. Oh, what's next? I want to look at that vulture. Tree's right outside this door. All right, Margot. After you. Thank you. There. There's our charming feathered friend. Still perched and still imperturbable. And still possessed of that confounded voice. Margot, take a look at this. What is it? A wire? Yes. And if I'm not mistaken, it... Well, let's give it a yank and see what... <clears throat> My, 
what a long tail he has. Long copper and properly insulated. Just a minute now. Yeah. There we are, Margot. Mr. Vulture's innards. His heart, soul, and mind are all encased in this little device. Looks like a radio loudspeaker. That's exactly what it is. I had no idea vultures were such deceitful creatures. Margot, you take the car, drive to the village, and phone the police. Don't let them know who you are, but tell them to get out here right away. What are you going to do? I'm going to follow this wire. It'll probably lead to one of those abandoned guardhouses at the edge of the moor. Tell the police to watch for a flashlight signal. Then rush to the location and hold anybody they may find there. The shadow is going to find a human vulture at the other end of this line. <laughs> Longer this time. Let Cebu signal to take it down and bring it in. Okay, Montessor. Here goes. Fine. We can disconnect that microphone now. Don't you want me to do the hounds again? Yes, yes, of course. I can sound as if they're coming back across the moor. Go ahead, the speaker's open. <laughs> what was that? Did you do that, Stevenson? No. Keep him over there by the door of the hut. That laugh is not in Stevenson's repertoire of impersonation as Montessor. Stevenson. What in thunder is this? Do you see anybody? I'll answer for him, Montessor. He can't see me any more than you can. Well, who are you? I am the Shadow. Shadow? Oh, yes, I've heard of you. Quite an elaborate array of insanity-producing machinery you have here. What do you mean? This is a simple portable broadcasting outfit. We're radio amateurs, that's all. Hey, yeah, sure, that's all. Amateurs at radio, but professionals at crime. I'm afraid you're making a mistake. You're the one who's made the mistake, Montessor. You made the mistake of thinking you could drive Millicent Chancellor mad. Or at least make her believe herself mad. This is ridiculous. I don't know what you're talking about. Your denials don't interest me, Montessor. I'm only concerned with destroying your plans. Your control over Mills, Matt Chancelford, and the fortune is at an end. What's that? A couple of automobiles coming along East Drive. The police, Montessor, coming for you and your impersonating confederate. The police? Come on, Stevenson, run for it. Come on, let's... Run, Montessor, run to your doom. Oh, oh stop or we'll shoot. <laughs> Castle looks a lot different than it did the first time we came here, eh, Margot? Mm-hmm. So glad those kids are getting married. She looks very lovely in that wedding gown, doesn't she? Mm. Say, are you listening to me? Yes. Yes, I was just thinking. What about? What would happen if you were ever married? Now, Margot. Oh, don't be alarmed, Lamont. This is pure supposition. I was just thinking of you walking up the aisle just as Robert is now. Yes. Ready to take the sacred vows that would endure for the rest of your life. Yes, Margot. And then all of a sudden, somebody would shoot the best man, the minister would fall down poisoned, and the bridesmaid would be stabbed, and you'd be off again on another case that would bust up the whole darn thing. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Shadow Magazine is on sale at your local newsstand. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. (laughs) 